This conference will now be recorded. Great. All right. Welcome, everyone. Today, we're going to be reviewing potential updates to the Bay Mini Grant selection criteria. Let me share my screen with you. And can we see this? Okay. Yes. Great. And while I'm screen sharing, I cannot see y'all. So if you're like raising your hand or, or something like that, um, just shout it out because I can't see you right now. Um, all right. So we are going to go through and just give each person an opportunity to um, <clears throat> provide some uh, feedback on the criteria. And then we'll spend a few minutes after that. Um, Discussing those updates. Let's see how many people Oops, do we have just here? Disappeared. It's okay. Yeah, I'm just I'm clicking back and forth between my tabs. Sorry. Um, how many? We've got seven people. Let's each take uh, two minutes and just say which things we're good with, which things we would like to see changed. Um, if you have any generic feedback. Um, yeah, just throw throw anything out there that you want others to know, and we'll use whatever we say in, in this portion as a basis for discussion in the next portion. Does that sound good to you all? Yep, sounds good. Cool. Um, I'm going to go in order of the people I can see in my uh, attendees list, and I'll start with... Um, I'm going to do TBEP staff last, so I'm going to start with Cynthia. So Cynthia, if you just want to take two minutes and um, yeah, tell, give us any feedback on these recommended updates. Oh gosh, I knew you were going to call on me first because I haven't had I haven't had a chance to look at look at all of the changes what, yet. Do you, um, want, do you want me to skip you for now? What what would your preference be? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess if if somebody else can can go, um, I, sure. I mean, I, I guess in general, I'm all about like streamlining, the, like, you know, combining things and making things easier to understand. So, you know, some of those um, that was kind of the, the purpose. So I'm all for those. Um, but yeah, if somebody else wants to go, I can uh, chime in. OK, um, yeah, Marjorie is first on my list after you. So Marjorie, if you want to go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah. As I started to say before, a lot of the things that I have um, have issues with are some of the terminology. I did not like. Um, I found measurable benefits to be a little uh, unclear because I don't think that that really works for a lot of the projects. Um, I. And I did not like clearly defined success metrics because I also don't think that that trans necessarily translates, particularly since many of the people who have been doing the judging, um, they've been doing this for a while. And I think they have a good idea of what it is that they're looking at. I did not understand what was really meant by hands-on participation. I do not like points for partnerships because I think that is too vague and it then credits people who are working with others or have contacts, and, but that isn't necessarily who we're looking for at this time. And I also don't like the idea of giving um, a monetary denomination to matching funds for volunteers, because I think that is way too easy to abuse that and have it make it look like, I can understand if people collect money or get things donated to them for the work, but the idea of putting, what was it, $31.60 or $36.10 um, as a value per hour for the work time, I, I think that does not, um, I don't think that translates to these projects. 
And gee, that's the only, those are the only things that I don't like. Okay. <laughs> um, were there things that you do like or things that you're neutral on? I was either neutral or liked everything else. It did not, I thought that the explanations in general, except for the things I mentioned, I thought that the explanations or the, um, the changes were self-explanatory and were easy to, to follow and to understand and, the, and fit into the framework of the mini grants. Okay. All right, Megan, if you want to go ahead, take two minutes and give your feedback. Sure. I uh, liked a lot of the changes, um, in particular the addition of the um, underburdened, com overburdened community, underserved community um, priority, um, giving points to those projects. Um, I thought the combination um, for community education uh, excuse me, the criterion for detailed budget and cost appropriate, the combination was really um, the right move. And I just wanted to bring up that we had mentioned in the review um, that groups that submitted applications year after year, we kind of took a second look at those. Um, I didn't know if there was a way that we could encourage their partner organizations, say the Florida Aquarium uh, does a lot of applications every year and they're always working with other groups. Is there a way that we could in motivate them to support their partner group to submit an application instead of them applying themselves um, every year for the same project? Um, uh, I personally thought that the um, addition of the project engaging the underserved or overburned communities could even go higher in point value, but that was just me. And those were really my only critiques. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and Cynthia, we're back to you unless you want me to do the TBEP staff first and then come back to you. And if you're talking, I can't hear you. Sorry, I couldn't find the button. <laughs> okay. uh, I'm like, I'm so used to Teams. I'm like, ah, where is everything? Um, the, yeah, I I think I, I just looked, looked through everything. I like all the additions and and, and definitely the, the streamlining. And I, I think I understand the, the reason behind adding in the like, you know, sort of like success criteria items. Like that's like any like, land management plan or whatever you know you want to know like how are you measuring success of your project um but i i do kind of understand uh, marjorie's uh hesitancy a little bit with that like oh gosh like how are we gonna like if somebody's doing an educational thing like how do you like somebody might be confused as to what that means and and so mm -hmm. maybe there needs to be a little bit more clarification of like with some examples or something um just to to say like well, we're going to distribute, you know, this many things, or we're going to educate this many people. Like, it doesn't have to be like, we're going to force people to recycle or whatever, you know, or whatever it is. Like, it, it can be, um, you know, some sort of metric that is tied to what they're doing, not necessarily tied to the outcomes that other people that they can't control are doing. Um, so maybe that's the only um, thing that I might make an addition of. Okay, great. Um, and now I will start with TBEP staff and Blake, you're the first. Do you wanna provide any feedback? Yeah, um, I had a few questions about just sort of me never having scored um, any of these Bay Mini grants. Some of them I was just wondering how it works in practice. Um, Cause so things like this, you know, you have points allocated for the optional matching of funds. And it just was like confusing to me that if this is something that's not required, if you have one applicant who doesn't have matching in their proposal versus an applicant that does, 
does the applica applicant with matching now get extra points over the applicant that didn't have this optional thing and you know and and the fairness of that if it's not something that they're required to have um so so however that works um in practice it just flagged to me that i thought you know if something is all instead of giving it extra points which then would put you know the people that are still following the requirements at a disadvantage um i thought you know that that optional matching of funds i think what you're really trying to get at that sort of point is you know them being able to demonstrate that they can actually achieve what they want to do right because they have people supporting it they have more money coming in and stuff like that and so i thought that optional matching thing could actually just be a way to measure this other one that we have here which is the ability for an applicant to complete the project is clearly demonstrated so this way a person can demonstrate you know five out of five that they are able to you know complete this project but you also have another applicant that maybe you know maybe that you know it's kind of like oh maybe they don't have the necessary experience you know so maybe they get like a three out of five in that but we can see that they're getting a bunch of donations or they've got a lot of volunteer hours to actually give them the capacity for it so that's where then that optional matching of funds can contribute to their score without penalizing the people who didn't have that optional thing, um, if all that makes sense. Um, but so that's kind of what I was thinking about one of them. Um, another one sort of kind of in the same vein where you have, uh, you know, any partner organizations are relevant to the project and clearly defined. What happens if someone has if an applicant doesn't have any partners, if it's just them, but they seem like they can, they're well within capacity to complete the project and they're involving the right communities and all this stuff, are they penalized because they have no partners? You know, does someone who maybe doesn't have as good of capacity, but they have more partners involved, are they automatically getting an advantage over someone else? Um, that one, I'm not entirely sure what the solution what the solution might be to that but it was just another spot that i was confused about how that actually gets scored and and the fairness between applications uh for that yeah. uh, criteria mm -hmm. and then just the last other idea that i had was thinking yeah, about just so you, uh, you know you're at like four minutes so if you oh how long was i give a lot two minutes Oh, okay. <laughs> but go, but go. Keep last, the last one is just that I think the ability of the applicant to complete the project is clearly demonstrated. I feel like that should be more than five points um, so that we aren't funding things that have a low likelihood of actual success. But, okay, that's all. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, and then I've got Carly is up next. Hey, I'll be pretty short because my voice hurts. So I'll uh, take Blake can have some of my time. Um, but I, what he was saying about the ability of applicant to complete the project, um, I think this is partially just me never having done this before. Um, but I was curious how you guys determine that, what the actual metrics are for um, consideration in that. Um, I also really like the underserved and overburdened community. Um, agree with a lot of what was already said, um, especially the hands on participation and involvement. It does seem like some of the ones that you've had in the past wouldn't involve that. Um, so how you're determining, do they have to involve that now? Or is anyone that does have hands on participation and involvement just automatically scoring higher than other types of projects? Okay, thank you. Um, and then, Erica, you're here. Um, Erica, do you want to give, take uh, maybe just like a really quick minute um, on any feedback that you have for what we're looking at today? 
No, I, I mean, I missed the first part. I'm sorry, I had a student in my office, so I couldn't join right away. But the no, my big focus is, um, I think, just making sure that um, we are culturally appropriate to new audiences that might need, to, I think we've discussed this one other time, that might need to have certain things in an application that we might have forbidden in the past. So originally we had issues with, you know, like food and t-shirts, but we're finding that sometimes participation increases in certain audiences if you have things like food and t-shirts. And those are just completely silly, innocuous examples, but I think we um, just need to look at what's appropriate in different audiences and different neighborhoods and different regions that we work with. Okay. That conversation before, I don't know if Jan Allen's in here or not, but. Okay. Um, and then Sheila, do you want to um, give some feedback? Yeah, so I really like that you pulled out um, like some of the things that were originally in the criteria and made them like now just requirements. Um, so like application is eligible, it addresses CCMP, those uh, the scope of work and budget are provided. I, I think that that's great that you just had that as a requirement. Um, I don't have any real strong feelings about the, the other parts of the criteria and I'll kind of defer to the community advisory committee to for, for their input. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, all right, so what, did anyone not go? I didn't skip anyone, right? There's only eight of us here, okay. Um, Sheila, maybe you can help me with this. What, there's some questions here in, in some of this, so maybe we can provide some uh, both answers and clarification for some of the reasons that things are included. Um, Sheila, do you want to go first? Do you want me to sort of tackle that? Um, which, okay. So, so like clearly defined success metrics, oh. for instance. Um, um. Maybe talk about why that's in there and um, if, if there's a way to make it clearer or more applicable to, to every type of project, we can talk about that, but. Um, yeah, so, so I will say that these, these uh, criterion are provided in the um, kind of information packet and they're also basically reworked to be like questions to prompt people in their scope of work development. So folks should be answering these questions or hitting like hitting all these points in their in their scope of work. So those those are like specifically called out in the, the scope of work uh, template. So um, so for like measurable benefits and clearly defined success metrics, I know Cynthia, you had mentioned that um, that it would be that that might be unclear or um, that maybe having examples would would be beneficial. So we do include examples for um, both an education project as well as a restoration project, um, and say you know these are these are just examples. Um, that there, there are others that you might want to consider, you might want to come up with on your own. Um, and so, and there's also in the scope of work, there is a specific like de deliverable section where we outline those different examples that somebody might, might consider using. Um, um, and the, the volunteer match, maybe uh, explain that too. Yeah, so the the volunteer match, um, this is something that we have been using in the past, um, and we provide a link to the updated value of a volunteer time each year for people when they're developing their budgets. Uh, so this isn't um, just a number that we created. This is a number that's developed by um, or is calculated by the independent sector. And um, it's 
it's unique to Florida and basically considers like um, what you would have to pay staff and workers comp and, and all of those types of things. So this number is updated annually and we already are providing that, that link for folks. Um, so like even if an organization might not have a bunch of um, like funds coming in, um, a bunch of funds coming in, uh, they can also use volunteer kind of time as quote unquote matching funds. So like the in-kind funds. Um, and really the purpose of the Bay Mini Grant is to, to get community members involved in Bay restoration. So every single project should have some volunteer enga engagement component. So we see that, or at least I see that volunteer match or like in-kind match as kind of like a gimme in a way. And for y'all watching what I'm doing, I'm just uh, gonna start graying out things that we sort of addressed. Um, and um, and things that we liked and we don't need to address, like adding the underserved, um, under overburdened. Um, I what was I gonna add to what you just said, Sheila? Oh yeah, the the volunteer match right is in there each year, and and I can see how you might think it could be abused, and certainly I think we've seen um applications where people just throw in sure. a ton of <laughs> right but like we we can evaluate that you know like we can we can see that and and decide when when y'all are reviewing that um and yeah if uh if you haven't yet check out the info packet from last year and the scope of work template um the clearly defined success metrics are provided in that um it, with examples Marjorie, I do agree with you on the measurable benefits um, term. I, I hate that term, yeah. <laughs> but it is something that we have used in, um, for example, the Tampa Bay Environmental Restoration Fund or TBRF. That's our other grant program. I, I do hate it. I, I think I would rather say clearly defined success metrics or if you have a suggestion on a better way to say benefits that are measurable that <laughs> benefits to the watershed that are measurable <laughs> i am all ears because i agree i don't like this term so do any of y'all have a, a better like uh just quick term that we could replace measurable benefits <clears throat> or do we just spell it out clearly defined metrics of success for this project you know i don't i don't know Jessica, I, you... I, I'm, I mean, I've been thinking of a lot of the different projects and until they're frequently, you have no idea what you would, what is going to be a measurable benefit. And the people who are doing it don't until it's over and <laughs> different things become apparent. And I, and I think that saying that this is something that you're judging on before anyone would have any idea of what it's going to turn into i mean i could come well, up with a little... help me understand what you mean by I... that because to, to me i think when they are setting out a project they know what i think they should know what success looks like whether whether that means planting 20 trees or engaging 50 volunteers like I think you do have to know what success would look like for the project, but maybe I'm misunderstanding what you're saying. I'm not sure. I think we want the project to define success for themselves. We don't need right. a specific goal. We want every project right. to tell us what their goal is and how they would measure that. And uh, it's I use the phrase to myself like self-defined self-defined goals um i don't that's just what i'm thinking yeah yeah so when i was reviewing i would look for phrases and scope of work that would tell me that they know what they're looking for that they have set goals for themselves and maybe that is 
more what we should be looking for than putting in this phrase measurable benefits like you're saying mm -hmm. does marjorie is that getting more to what you're i i think so because it at least you know if you say self-defined goals you at least have an idea of when you're making a judgment on this project what do they consider um what do they consider a success what is it that they're looking for uh, as opposed to yeah well, I, I don't I think mind, it's success. I don't mind that <laughs> I think that okay. I think that will at least give you an idea when you say well they're looking for 10 people to come out and do this and other people are looking for 100%, but it gives you an idea of what it is that they, how, not necessarily how hard they're going to work, but what is it that they think, what what is success to them? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Uh, I think we're getting to a better place on that. Let's skip down to a couple questions that I believe Blake asked with optional matching funds and partner organizations. Um, I think you're right that if you are are showing matching funds or partnerships with other organizations, it does put you above those that do not provide matching funds or do not show that they're partnering with another organization. I think that's kind of the point. I think there are, I almost added this that like you have to have a minimum score of whatever 70 to be considered for an application uh, to be considered for funding um but sheila and i discussed that and decided we didn't want to put that firm number in in the description but if uh if you noticed i took i, I didn't put this in here but if you add up all the points for things that are um, necessary and if they do a really good job so if they get all of the points for that um, thing for instance it it adds up to like 75 or 80 or something like that and then if you add points for things that are optional like partner organizations and matching funds that puts you up to a hundred so I think if anyone is in the range of like 70 to a hundred that's a good project um, but yeah, you do get rewarded with additional points if you are doing also the optional things like partner organizations um, and matching funds. Does that make sense? Does, do you like that? Do you dislike that? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I don't like that personally, just because if I see something that says optional, I would assume that I'm not gonna be penalized for not doing it right? because you are penalizing them um for something that they are not required to do um so yeah so so i totally understand them. how would you get around that you know like is there a way <laughs> to because we've had this in the info packet and in the criteria every year but it has been unclear from like points some people i the questions that i got this year were do I have to have a partner organization? Is that required? I'm like, no, but it does help your application. It does help in the review process. So how do we, is there a way to, to do that? Uh, well, that you so, think is so, so I would then say the solution is thinking into why those, like what you're trying to get at with those points. And so it seems to me that the reason why you were giving out points for the matching funds is because that would enhance their ability to complete the project, right? If they have more support coming in, um, they show they have more money coming in, then in theory, like, right, you have more confidence that they'll be able to get something done. And same thing if you have more partners, right? If you have more partners, more people at the helm, in theory, you know, it, it might be easier or more realistic for them to be able to get something done. So I, I would agree, just say I agree with you with the optional fund, the matching funds part with but with partner organizations, I think it is not just the the ability to do it, but also pulling in new partners and working with even more community members. So it's that community building aspect 
so just to clarify like why partner orgs i think are yeah so, so then i would say for that uh, matching funds that is then just a measure of uh, our, uh, a score that you already have which is about their ability to demonstrate that they can complete the project right so then if, so if you have those two separate then you effectively have two things measuring the same end goal um, right so if you just consolidate them into one and say that oh if they have um, matching funds that can increase their score on their you know demonstrable ability to complete the project but they can still perfectly show that they're able to complete the project even if they don't have matching funds so that way no one's getting penalized um, but the people that do include that optional thing it could you know help to show this thing that maybe in other places if they're lacking it would make up for but then we also have like an optional item of the project supports this year's priority which a new priority is defined each year and that's optional but that gives you additional points so basically it like you're prioritized for funding similar to like if you have a lot of volunteer engagement then you're then bumped up higher one of the things i thought about doing was at, was moving all of the optional stuff to one section so that it's clear these things are optional but if you do choose to add them to your project it certainly helps you in the review process Is where that does it that... where the the current um document you have here doesn't say that it's optional right but it's not right i almost put optional like this and i uh i didn't at the end of the day but I could, I, we could, I mean, technically all of it's optional. <laughs> like if they, uh, even with the ability of the applicant to complete the project, we have brand new applicants who've never done a project like this before. So they don't have that demonstrated ability because they've never done it, but that's still, well, that's, it's That's still not the only eligible. way to measure it though. Like just because they haven't yeah. done a, a Bay Mini Grant before isn't how you would measure if they're able to complete the project right but to it's harder for them to demonstrate if you know what i mean so it's five points if you have done for example this is all very um subjective but if you've done a project before you've shown that you've executed it and done it well you've met your own success metrics you probably would get a five if you have never done a project before but you're an organization that's been around for a few years this is your first time tackling a, a grant or anything like that you might get like a two or something, you know, so it's it's extremely subjective to begin with. Um, I would disagree a lot with that, but if that's the way that you guys do it, okay. <laughs> I, I, I don't like that at all. I, I think that you, I think that we have seen some stellar projects over the years from people who have never done a project um had a lot of determination they had figured a lot of things out beforehand but they had not done anything before and they came up with some fantastic ideas some fantastic projects and i don't i don't like that you're rewarding the same group or the same criteria over and over uh, because well, someone I'm not, has... because I don't score it. You guys are the ones that score it. So if you want to, no, I'm not. Well, no, <laughs> I have, but I'm saying, but but you're saying that you have a point value. You're that you're saying this is an optional point value for someone who has done a project before. So are you already losing? Now, a lot of people can do it and have done it without yeah. any prior experience and maybe without the I've, I've seen projects where they've listed all of their successes and all of the things they've done and they've never been what they they've never been that great they haven't been that they haven't done what we wanted so yeah. I, I don't like the idea of cons of rewarding someone more than once for 
what I think Blake was saying is the same thing. So uh, I'd like to hear from others on these two points with the, well, not just these two, but the, the more optional things like partner organizations and matching funds. Is that something that y'all think should not be included in the criteria? Like, is that, I'm not sure if that's what you're suggesting, but is there a way that others would like to see this done differently? Or do we, are we okay with the way that it's laid out? I like the addition of having partner organizations submit letters. I maybe it could be loosened up. Um, for instance, when I remember a couple applicants submitted letters from previous volunteers with or that organization and talked about how the work benef benefited them and how they enjoyed it, or now they sub suggest other people go work with this organization and um, I took that letter to be really powerful, even though they were not necessarily a partner on this project. Um, <clears throat> I also did not like on applications when people mentioned partners and did not submit letters that made me think that they um, had it communicated on this project and that counted against them for me um, that they actually couldn't fulfill the project that they had they're submitting because they don't even have partners that say that they're going to supply volunteers or whatever the case is. Um, so I don't think we should remove it. Um, um, yeah. Blake. Um, oh, wait. Erica, she can't see you. You can just talk. Oh, oh she can't see me. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I have a different opinion. Um, I mean, yeah, I'd like to see if people have partners, but it's, you know, it's a mini grant. And so the effort to get a partner to do a letter when we're all small organizations and busy people, it's not worth the time and effort. I mean, just to be blatantly honest, uh, you know, I have some standard letters that we've written and I'll just copy and paste and ask somebody to put their name on it. but. I'm at that point with the college where I have the team and the space and the time space to have time generated a letter um, uh, for people to just people kind of, just you know, like sign their name on. But um, I don't know. I, I think it's nice to ask, do they have partners, but maybe we just remove the score from it. So, Blake, do you think that it would make sense in um, your, like, if we outlined um, we did combine all of, all of the those three, so like the matching funds and the, the partners, and had it like as like an, an example of ways that you could show that you are able to complete or fulfill the project. Yeah, I think that would work. Um, maybe with one caveat being if you know, just Jessica mentioned that you know, the partner one is also not necessarily demonstrating, you know, a feasibility, I guess, but more so, I guess, like community involvement. So maybe it could kind of get split into, you know, partly being a measure of, you know, feasibility and, and their ability to complete it, but also maybe that could fall under the, you know, involvement with underserved and overburdened communities so maybe if they have more partners especially partners that work in that area or are BIPOC led groups or something like that then that can contribute to then to that overall thing um, not to make it too messy but it, it seems like that you know that particular one might kind of split into two different things of interest I guess I just don't see the the reason to split it when it like it's being reviewed in a totality, you know, like <clears throat> partner show ability and involvement. I don't know. Just thinking out loud. 
I think a benefit to splitting it would be less for the review committee and more for those applying so that they realize that there are two benefits to having partners, not that we're just looking for it for to make sure that they can get the job done, but also that it is a priority of the Bay Mini Grants for community involvement. So is there a bigger bias to shift away from, um, you know, because quite honestly, like I wouldn't expect Tampa Bay Watch to list four partners because they're capable in-house. Right, but they're capable, but they could partner with a brand new, they could partner with Dream Defenders, for instance, and that could show that they're helping increase capacity of other organizations. Okay, so why is that? Maybe that's the question. You know, are you are you are you helping to increase capacity with other organizations, or are you? Maybe it's a different question than just list your partner organizations, right? Because you would you want it to be you want it to be the same question for everybody. Yeah, yeah. I I like what Erica is saying, and I think that really sort of helps us get at you know making sure that each thing that we're scoring on is a is a specific measure of the thing that we're looking for and so like you know as erica says if like if we get just really specific that says oh you know let's not just list a metric for something that we want to measure let's actually just say what it is that we want and so if you know demonstrating that they have multiple partners means that they're showing us their ability to help build capacity with organizations. Let's just directly say, you know, are they helping to build capacity with or other organizations? I also like that phrasing as well. Um, it gets back to a point that I made at the beginning um, that we can um, still provide grant from a funding for an applicant who applies many, many times. Uh, because they're doing this work with other partners um, to build that capacity. And then they wouldn't necessarily be penalized for being a face that we see all the time. I, I could be into that. Um, so maybe it's just a component that says, you know, please explain your, your community capacity building here. Do you have partner organization? You know, give them some examples of what community capacity building is and they can fill it in. So do you have partner organizations? Do you have volunteers? Do you have matching funds? Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm going to consider this one addressed and well, I'm going to obviously have to come back with a, a secondary uh, edit. Um, Uh, this point, the hands-on participation and involvement. I don't remember who said this, but do others think that we need to clarify this point? It might be nice to just say, tell us more about how your participants will be involved because you know, it could be that they're just watching movies or they're hiking or they're, I don't think hands-on has to be that they picked up trash and went kayaking, but it, but it could be. So the, the, let me clarify that we wouldn't be asking questions in the selection criteria. We would say shows, demonstrates yeah. how participants will be involved yeah. and it's that yes. those points so yeah and others do you would you prefer it to be like worded like that like application shows project shows hands-on participation involvement actually what does it currently say Where is that point? It's right under know. community support and ability to execute 40 points. So, yeah. 
Okay. I mean, in my opinion, that that is what we're asking there. But if there's a way to change that, what what recommendations yeah. do y'all have? Does community stewardship just make it clunkier for the reviewers? Maybe. Uh, Erica, is that what would you think about involvement? It says involvement, hands-on yeah, participation or involvement. If the project enhances community stewardship through, we could even remove I, this. Hands-on. No, hands the project enhances. Uh, go go back and take out the words hands-on instead. The project enhances community stewardship through participation or involvement. Because I think for me, like when I've reviewed in the past, hands-on, I was looking for like, okay, how many times did they go out plan to plan, or, like, Yeah, or did they kayak or did they pick up trash, or like a physical activity? I, I would like to clarify this somehow because otherwise I think that people will say, Oh, we posted it on social media and we have 10,000 followers, so we involve 10,000 people. Um, okay. So I, I think there's a medium between those two. What, how about active participation? Yeah, do others like that? Sure, sounds good. <laughs> All right, we've got just a couple more minutes, y'all, 10 minutes. Um, I saw Jan Allen dropped on, jumped on. Um, Jan, do you have anything you want to add to, the, to this conversation or have you had an opportunity to look over what Jessica developed? here and do you have any like thoughts or opinions what you liked what you didn't like that kind of stuff uh, no i apologize for being late i was got stuck in another meeting uh no i'm just looking at the notes it looks like you guys are on the right track and um addressing a lot of the things that i know to have been confusing or unclear for reviewers or participants or applicants so i think it's good what you have I didn't have any other any other comments. Um, let's talk about the higher point value for underserved. I don't know why I keep doing it. Underserved and overburdened communities. Do others are others interested in raising the point value on this? What is it now? Five. Are we going to provide applicants a way to determine whether their project is addressing yes. underserved yeah. communities? A map uh, that was a output of Blake's work or something mm -hmm. of that kind? Okay. Yeah, that, that will be provided in the information packet so that they can okay. uh, determine if it's applicable. Sounds like there's not interest in raising this value, so I'm going to remove that. Um, Do we want to talk about this for a moment? The the volunteer appreciation type of things like t-shirts or food, for instance. Food is allowed. Um, typically, we don't do things that are potentially throwaway items like um, t-shirts or or giveaways. But Erica, it sounds like you're interested in reevaluating that. Yeah, and Jan's on the call now, so maybe she, I know that we've talked about it before, trying to be more um, appropriate with the different requests from some of our, um, some of our applicants, 
um, maybe it's not such a thing anymore, but for a while there was quite a, often a request or an email that would come out going like, why can't we buy t-shirts? But um, I think there's a couple other things too that we've said no to, but um, I mean, obviously we're not gonna say yes to alcohol, but um, hmm. I'm not sure. Are you still on the call, Jan? Yep, I'm here. Um, but but also before we jump in on this conversation, I think it's a, important to point out this is currently not. I don't think this is currently addressed in the review criteria. It may be in the information packet, which might be a different conversation. Yeah, well, I was just thinking about, you know, in terms of the need for, um, right, we think they might need to buy 47 shovels, but what they actually needed to buy was, you know, 10 shirts that recognized the, the I don't know, the group leaders for all the events they had, right? That kind of thing. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to make those granular decisions, you know, because as you as you're pointing out it, what might be appropriate for one project might not be appropriate for another. Uh -huh. um, I think we already have a budget limit on food as a percentage of the okay. grant, which I think is good. Yeah. Um, I'm not I'm not sure how to communicate that. I, I think, you know, like what are our concerns about that and how can we address it? I do think that is a conversation outside of, of this review criteria. So I okay. I would like to ask that we table that for now maybe. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, this seems like an important thing to clarify. Um, for those that have reviewed mini grants and Sheila as the, as the manager, how, how do you answer, how would you answer this? How is the demonstration of ability of the applicant determined? I mean, to me, it's like throughout, like, the, the whole application comes together to, to give a score for this, but maybe y'all have different ideas. Yeah, and there's also like specific questions in the scope of work or um, like the prompts in the scope of work template that ask people to, to describe maybe their experiences in the past working on these events, or sorry, working on grants, um, and and why they think they would be successful. But I've also never scored them before, so I might defer to some of the the CAC members on what they what they use. Yeah, I, I agree. It's kind of an overall impression of. Um, who is this organization? How long have they been around? What other projects have they done? Who are they partnering with? So it, it seems like it's it's um, a combination of answers of different questions. Um, and also just their description of what they're going to do. Is it very specific? Do they have they thought it out? Do they have a plan? Um, or or is the description of what they want to accomplish and how they're going to do it very vague. Yeah. So we are coming up on one o'clock. I think this was all really helpful and a good conversation. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can see you guys. Um, so how would y'all like to proceed from here? I, I think maybe I should take some of this feedback and further update uh, this document and send it back to y'all for reevaluation. Does that sound like a good next step? A couple of nods, yeah. cool. Um, yes. And then we can decide from there 
if we're okay with giving it a thumbs up or if we want to meet again to have some further discussion. Does that sound okay with y'all? Cool. Yes. Yeah, sounds fair. All right, any last parting things that you think is what uh, really needs to be, have a quick address with the group here? Because then ultimately, once you guys come up with like your proposed changes, um, that will go before the full CAC, right? I Yeah, I imagine so, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think when is the next? It's in March. Is the next CAC meeting? Oh, probably January. 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 Okay. Twenty fifth. Yeah, probably January. Okay. I don't know why I thought it was so far out. Um, yeah, I I think we could certainly wrap this up and have it um, brought to the CAC. Oh, maybe I was thinking we would bring it first to the January meeting, and if there were any further changes that uh, the full CAC wanted to see made, we could make those and then bring it back for final approval at March if needed, but hopefully in January. Uh, okay. Any other questions about the process or anything like that? I have a question not about the process. I think your last, sure. the October meeting says it's scheduled for Thursday. The date that you sent out is a Thursday. Oh, geez. Um, um, October 24. October 24 is a Thursday. Yes. Well, I will, I will modify those. I haven't officially put them on the calendar, so I will make sure it's not a Thursday. Sorry for the confusion. Thanks for bringing it to my attention. <laughs> Well, I noticed it and I, you know, I write things far ahead on my calendar, so. Well, I appreciate you noticing it because I often overlook things. Um, so it'll be that then like the Wednesday, the day before. All right, y'all, I appreciate you. I'm gonna end recording.